Well, good morning again, and uh, just want to welcome everyone on behalf of the Hunterdon County Chamber of Commerce. For those of you that I don't know, my name is Chris Phelan. I'm the president of the chamber and really want to welcome everyone. We've already had an exciting start for some of you as we kicked off our networking this morning and uh, really had some, some high energy. This is always one of the highlights, I think, of the chamber year. Uh, this is our 12th annual Women's Leadership Summit, and um, it really is a, a program that uh, you know, we've, we've grown to, to love over the years and has been cultivated by a dynamic group, our, our Women's Business Forum. Uh, I'm not sure if she's on yet. Uh, Ann Thornton was the original founder of our, our forum and we kicked off the summit and uh, really wanna thank all those that serve, especially Colleen Dewar, our chair. And we'll be uh, thanking you know, the members of our committee shortly this morning. But on behalf of the chamber, I, I really thank all of you. It has been, as we all know, a tremendously challenging, uh, well, we're into 13 months post uh, March of 2020. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, the chambers tried us as we have since uh, 1916, we've been serving the business community to really be that advocate and that resource. And uh, that's what it's about. You know, if we can stay true to our mission, which is to strengthen our economy, and we do that directly like the programs we're gonna experience this morning, each of you and your organizations, the stronger each of us as members of our respective organizations, as members active in the community uh, can be, we can strengthen our, our individual businesses, the, the nonprofits, the community groups, all of that leads to a strong hundred and county. So just know that we're still a resource, we're still out there, we're still pushing information out there. Um, you know, a lot of other programs, those businesses that are still challenged, um, I really wanna emphasize, reach out to us, uh, the state just announced 85 million in direct lending to small business and nonprofits. And that's coming through a series of grant programs that's underway right now. So if you're, you're trying to navigate that process or want information or, or need some technical assistance on the application, reach out to the chamber. We can help you on that and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, at least um, there's an ability to uh, help respond and continue to move forward with your respective organization. And if you're, you're doing well, that, that's incredibly well, and we invite you to get involved with the chamber and uh, we can tap your, your resources and strength to help uh, collectively our business community. And that's really, I think what our, our program theme is resiliency. We, we see it in Hunterdon County. We're gonna hear it this morning in Hunterdon County. So I wanna kick off and just thank uh, some of our key sponsors. Really wanna thank uh, Michelle Heidi of Michelle Heidi and Associates. Um, Michelle has been an incredible leader in our community in so many things. She's a past chair of our Hunterdon County Chamber Board of Director, the immediate past chair. She served in that capacity for three years, active with our women's uh, you know, business forum and, and so many things. So I want to throw it to Michelle real quick. Did you want to say a, a word of welcome? Sure. I just wanted to say welcome, everybody. Excited to be here again this morning. It's hard to believe we're going into our 12th year. And I just wanted to share, you know, as everyone knows, I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. And I read something recently that basically said the best antidote to stress is resilience, having the ability to respond to change or adversity proactively and resourcefully. And I'm sure as we're all going to hear this morning from our speakers, they've done a fantastic job being able to do that. So again, welcome, everybody. Excited for today's programs. Thank you, Michelle. I want to thank uh, one of our other presenting sponsors, uh, Hunter and Healthcare. As we know, Hunter and Healthcare has done an incredible job stepping up, as they always do, but especially over the last uh, 13 months for our community, their response to this pandemic, uh, what they've done, you know, on the medical front. We can't thank enough, you know, the entire team there, from all of the frontline workers to the doctors to the administration to the nurses to the technicians to everyone that has served so many families in their time of need, and they continue to do so much outreach to our community. They continue to um, run incredible vaccination clinics. I was at a meeting this week and uh, over 85,000 Hunterdon County residents have uh, already begun to receive either their first or second dose. And the healthcare system in partnership with the County of Hunterdon and other private sector partners like ShopRite of Hunterdon and some of our other pharmacies, just an incredible job they're doing. We know as we get into this vaccination mode, um, we know we can start to really start to open up our economy and get things going. So it's just such a critical role and kudos and thanks to Hunter and Healthcare. I don't know if Kathleen Selick or um, Kim Bland is on the, the call there. Are either of them here? I know Kim was gonna be joining us. I'm not sure if she's on. Good morning, it's Good Kim morning, Blanda. Kim. Yeah, if you wanna say something real quick, that'd be great. Hi, and I apologize. I woke up with a migraine this morning, so I'm gonna yeah. keep my camera off. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Thank you so much. You know, Hunter and Healthcare uh, and me specifically, I know Kathleen, if she's on the call, we work very closely with the chamber and appreciate everything that they do for our business community. And 
it, it's very interesting when I got into healthcare, I never realized how, um, how important it was to collaborate with so many different sectors because your health really is in every different sector, including the business sector. So, um, so I'm very excited to be here today. I have done some work in resilience and I, I do really believe in it. Um, so I'm excited to see what the presenters have to say today. So thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Kim. So thank you again to our two presenting sponsors. Just gonna go through very quickly some of our other sponsors. Wanna thank again, uh, Ann Thornton, MSI Plumbing and Remodeling. They have been our scholarship sponsor. We've got some on here this morning for the last 12 years. So we really thank them. The scholarships are a phenomenal opportunity, especially this year for, for our small businesses and individuals. Um, you know, to enable them to uh, participate in this great program. So thank you to MSI, to both Anne and uh, her, her daughter, Audra, you know, for all that they do for our community. Want to thank, uh, again, back to Kim Blanda, but thank her, the Partnership for Health. They too are a scholarship sponsor this year. The partnership represents over 60 organizations. Many of you are involved with it. If you're not, get involved and, and reach out to Kim. It's a credible organization. They too, kudos, have been doing so much for our community uh, during the past uh, 13 months. Want to thank our supporting sponsors this morning, uh, 100 and Radiological Associates, for all that they do for the chamber and the business community. We really appreciate their support. Want to thank uh, one of our other program sponsors, ShopRite of Hunterdon, both in Clinton and Flemington. The Kalillo family just does an incredible job and uh, supports so many times, so quietly, you know, so many organizations. So what they do for the community is, uh, you know, just incredible. And we really do appreciate all that they do. Want to thank uh, Raritan Valley Community College. They're a great partner serving Somerset, Hunterdon County. Uh, the community college is an incredible asset for the learning. We partner uh, specifically with their workforce development programs with the Small Business Development Center. So again, can't say enough about uh, what incredible educational uh, uh, institution we have here to serve Hunterdon County. Want to thank uh, one of our other program sponsors, Northlands, uh, a great asset and destination here in the county. They are now offering a meeting space and uh, social distancing in that meeting space. So just a, a really uh, neat destination. It's probably one of the most unique destinations uh, I got to say, you know, throughout our country, and, and we have it right here in our backyard. So encourage you to visit Northlands. Want to thank uh, one of our contributing sponsors, ExxonMobil, our, our, our largest private employer, you know, here in Hunterdon County. They too do so much behind the scenes quietly for so many organizations and are engaged, uh, you know, throughout the uh, county. So we really thank them and uh, are privileged to have them as part of our business community. Want to thank one of our promotional sponsors, BW Nice, another incredible organization that does so much in terms of uh, raising funds specifically, um, you know, for women charities and education. So we always thank them. They've been a longtime promotional sponsor and member of the chamber. Um, I really want to thank uh, the Wolverton Inn as well. They have provided some uh, incredible gift certificates for our speakers this morning in a way that we can thank them for giving their time and, and sharing their talents. So we really thank Mary and uh, the Wolverton Inn, and we hopefully will be having an event in September uh, sponsored by our Women's Business Forum down at the Wolverton Inn. So if you haven't been there, it'll be a great opportunity to join us and uh, see what a, an incredible destination, but highly recommend to visit it well before September. It's a great getaway. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, again, thank you to our sponsors. And I'm going to turn things over to a member of our Women's Business Forum, uh, Nicole Smith. Nicole is with Room to Read. She's a uh, weekly host on Hunter and Chamber uh, podcast radio here and uh, has a great show uh, interviewing nonprofits. And she's going to introduce our, our first speaker. So, Nicole, it is all yours. Thank you, Chris. Very happy to be here. And I very much enjoy being a part of the committee. Um, if you're a member of the chamber and you want to be part of the committee, we highly we invite you because we have a lot of fun and it's a great group of women. So I'm going to introduce our speaker, Nicole Piazza. Nicole is a lifelong resident of Hunterdon County. Having left for school and work, she always returns home. And now she and husband, Anthony, are raising their young family with daughters Tallulah and Zinnia here in Hunterdon County. She and her husband together have owned and operated the Clean Plate Kitchen in Clinton, New Jersey for over six years. They are committed to growing their passion for bringing healthy food to the community in a way that strengthens the local community and is inclusive for all types of diets and allergies. Clean, healthy eating is a cornerstone of life for owners Nicole and Anthony, Anthony Piazza and their young growing family. As the creative director of the restaurant, a holistic registered dietitian and Institute of Culinary Education trained chef, Nicole fully expresses her passion to nourish others with fresh, hearty, comfort food. 
Together, their combined efforts have led to a very different kind of dining experience, one that you can trust to be predominantly gluten-free, dairy-free, and full of plenty of vegetarian and vegan options. Nicole has a passion for teaching cooking and nutrition classes. Additionally, Nicole and Anthony have pivoted and launched a new business that evolved during the pandemic called Feel Good Food at Home. Using different cooking methods and preparations to provide meals that are fresh and ready to heat, eat, and enjoy brought to your doorstep. Not without challenges and growing pains, this new business model proved appropriate for the times and something that is sustaining power and passion for both Nicole and her husband, Anthony. Additionally, with the support of our community, they have donated over 4,000 meals to local frontline workers, first responders, and food insecure in Hunterdon County in the past year. With much personal struggle and many professional challenges, Nicole has found strength in the possibility of reinvention and surviving with creativity and a bit of hard work. She views each challenge as an opportunity to grow and learn from the experience. That wisdom has helped her to continue forging ahead and creating her own path. And I have eaten at the Clean, clean Plate Kitchen many times and I highly recommend it. And I'm um, so excited to, to have you here and hear your story. So I'm passing it over to the other Nicole. Morning, thank you. That sounded great, thank you. <laughs> it was nice coming from your voice, Nicole, appreciate it. So hello to everyone. I see many familiar faces and some new faces too. Um, when I think of resiliency, I think of fear and um, facing up to fears. And that's what I'm gonna speak about. I think inner incorporating personal as well as professional um, development and resilience, they're intertwined for me. And as a woman and being that's a woman's summit, I thought it was appropriate that I could include uh, family challenges as well um, today and share some personal experiences that have helped to um, help me to be more resilient and one of them would be public speaking, would be something that I really enjoy, but I'm petrified of it. So in person, I do much better. Zoom is a whole different thing where I can't feel, I can't feel what you're feeling the same way. And it definitely um, facing a fear and once again, overcoming something for an opportunity for learning and growth. So thank you, Michelle, for giving me another avenue to once again, um, face, you know, face that challenge. Um, I've often, probably more seriously considering it now, writing a book called The Art of Reinvention. I wasn't sure if it was because I'm a Gemini and just changed my mind a lot, or if it's with a closer look, realize that maybe it's actually a skill, um, something that I've learned. And there's being able to re reinvent myself, be resilient and make changes has been something that, um, wasn't necessarily a choice, but adversity has presented itself to me more often than um, maybe my years would, would warrant. Um, and in sharing some, I wanted to share just some, some of my personal experience that'll then intertwine into our restaurant story. And hopefully from my story, my experience, and some of the things I've learned along the way, um, I hope that you find some little gold tokens that you can take with you and use for yourself in um, challenging and navigating these difficult times. As coronavirus and COVID and this whole pandemic thing has come into light, I found that everyone I speak to has a different story and a different challenge that's been presented. And it seems like whatever part of your life was maybe a little out of balance, that part just sort of exploded. <laughs> And for us, my husband and I, our restaurant, owning a restaurant, um, that was the part that maybe was our most stressed or um, maybe not fully integrated and balanced. And that just kind of blew up in our face this past year as we figured out, um, you know, we were shut down and had a lot of challenges to overcome through that. Um, but before I get fully into the restaurant, I want to give you a little bit of um, just some understanding of some of the adversity that I've faced um, and what has helped me to now look at a situation and figure out how to grow through it and how to look at a challenge now as a, um, a growth opportunity and a learning opportunity for myself. Um, with, with, I was mentioning fear, fear of failure would be one of my core 
um, themes that comes up. And I, I've faced it time and time again. And with that fear of failure, I um, a, a dramatic or classic example for myself would be that I was a runner. Um, I was a competitive runner in high school. And the better I got, the more afraid I was of actually success. Um, fear of failing, fear of success, they were intertwined for me as I became more competitive and I was having panic attacks. And the panic attacks were actually happening during races in the last 100 meters of a race, regardless of whether it was a 5K or it was a 400 meter race. I was having blatant panic attacks as in high school. And this was something that um, I was became increasingly more petrified of how to handle that fear. And actually through hypnosis, ironic, that was an interesting experience that I was able to overcome that fear and had a breakthrough and realized this feeling of, wow, when that fear was released, my performance um, tremendously had improved. And so I saw that window of opportunity that there was a shift in myself and what happened in my ability versus what was going on in my head. And with that fear that how, what that was creating as a barrier. Um, unfortunately, as I was approaching our final state championships, I was, I had mono. And although I was tremendously disappointed, it was also this um, opportunity to not have to be afraid to face that fear. And it was an out for me, really. Um, that diagnosis, I, I carried it longer than maybe I needed to. And it's interesting that I can look back on it and see that I, that summer, I didn't go back to school or I went back to school to college, but I didn't run and I was afraid and the fear had mounted to a point where I didn't end up running. And that was my whole goal for why I went to the University of Vermont was for track and that fear had just continued to mount and it then evolved into anxiety and depression. Um, and, and it was something I wasn't truly familiar with and I wasn't able to identify. It took a long time to figure out what that anxiety, depression feeling was because they seem like such polar opposite feelings that somehow would go back and forth for me. Um, so through living life as a perfectionist, seemingly well put together, um, I was struggling. I was struggling for a long time. Fast forward to a abusive marriage, a failed marriage, um, a DUI, bankruptcy, um, foreclosure, my dog dying, <laughs> all in the same, oh, and lost my job, left my job, all within about a year. Um, talk about a rock bottom. Um, it was, it was a, you know, my seemingly perfect life that I had built based on making safe choices so that um, I wouldn't fail had completely blown up and I failed. It was my, my ultimate fear happened and I truly, in my eyes, failed. And um, I had two choices, give up, just quit, or figure out how to um, overcome those, those fears and that failure. And once I had realized I had failed, I had nothing else to lose. And I was grappling for some way to find a way out. And for me, I was going to church, um, a divorce support group, yoga, therapy, um, counseling, any possible AA, I went, anything you could imagine, I was just searching for something, some way to find, um, I didn't even know what it was that I was looking for, but I wanted, I knew there had to be a different way to overcome these fears and overcome this failure and find a new life for myself. And through that, I found for myself, it was a spiritual journey where I found myself. I found that my inner self and my inner intuition was something that I could trust and I hadn't listened to for my entire life. I was confused that this voice, who was this voice and relearning who that was. And I think it's something that you can find through, I might find it through love, you might find it through nature, you might find it through religion, you may find it through meditation, yoga, there's running, exercise, whatever it may be, there's a lot of different places to find that same, that same feeling, that same coming back to home to listen to yourself. 
when faced with adversity now and through this time, like through a tremendous amount of work and it's not gone per se, you know, it doesn't just disappear, but able to return to that place and know where I can come to just reset gives me the strength to face challenges and to, to look at a different situa a situation differently where, okay, here we go. It's happening again. This is a big one. This is scary, or this is unknown, or this is a very large challenge. What am I going to do? I'm going to take a deep breath and figure <coughs> out what can I learn from this opportunity? Because there's going to be something on the other end of it that I'm going to look at and say, okay, that, that situation led me to the next one that was where I was meant to be. And it's, you know, it helps us to continue to grow and evolve and make it to the next place and the next place. Because growth is not necessarily linear. You know, I, I think most of us, especially as women, can relate to the analogy that growth is, it's like childbirth. You know, we contract and we, we expand and we contract. And as we go through different experiences that feel more um, fluid and easier times, you know, we expand. And then there's times that really fear sets in and, and we contract and we hold back and we have to um, reset and come back to ourselves and figure out how to, how to find that, that inner calm again or that inner voice or whatever that feeling is. Business-wise with my husband and I, um, bringing us to present day, um, owning the restaurant has the clean plate kitchen that was created out of um, a challenge, out of an adversity. We originally had owned, my husband had owned a restaurant ready to close. He was done with it. He said he'd had enough. Um, it was the Riverview restaurant right on the river there. We had this beautiful location and seemingly it looks like this perfect idyllic spot. Of course you would be successful, um, but there's a tremendous amount of underlying challenges with that location. Um, we have created the restaurant in order to um, be sustainable. And that was our goal is how to create something that's sustainable rather than having a restaurant that um, was just feeding off of the busy times. We wanted something that would bring people back year round. So we had to adapt um, and we joined together to create the Clean Plate Kitchen. And in doing so, we used my background. So I'm a, a registered dietitian, as I was mentioned in my bio. Um, and through my self-work that I had done through myself, I had started my own practice. Um, Nourish to Heal was the name of my practice. And in that practice, um, my nutrition started to evolve from just nutrition. It realized that dealing with the core of other issues or the food and eating was often a symptom of other problems. So um, my approach became more of a mind, body, spirit approach that evolved while I was doing my personal work my professional business had evolved as well. And it, it was intermingled in those, those two growth, you know, as I was developing. And from there, that's where um, the awareness that I could evolve and take that same skill and apply it to a different thing. And so with the restaurant, the Clean Plate Kitchen, we thought, why not take my approach to, um, to life, to our approach. My husband was a, a partner, is a partner for me that my current husband, I should say, that is my, my rock, my person, my, um, my match that took a long time to find. Um, but we've created, he trusts my, the way he always says it is that he trusts my ideas and that he makes them happen. So he does the physical stuff, but trusts my, my belief um, in these ideas that are don't necessarily know where they come from. Um, they come from somewhere higher than myself. But the Clean Plate Kitchen was built on the idea that why not use what I'm already teaching to my clients? Why don't we create a safe place for them? This is something we both believe in. This is the way we eat. Let's create this for our customers. That's something we can be passionate off of. And that's something that's sustainable for us because we're not just serving food now. This is something that has core meaning to us. And this brought customers to us year round, which the problem with that location where we are, many of you may know where we are in Clinton along the river. 
Um, there's been a tremendous amount of turnover over the years in that location. And the reason being is that it's um, a beautiful summer location, but you have to be motivated to get there in the winter. You have, there's no parking. It's not an easy place to get to. The indoor space is not conducive to a lot of different things. So you had to really want to be there. So we thought, you know, why don't we find an audience that's captive that really wants to be there? And so it's a matter of just shifting the mindset instead of seeing it as this problem that we couldn't make this restaurant work, why don't we adapt the restaurant to make it work for the situation? You know, from there, um, we, we developed the restaurant and it's been very successful. Um, fortunately, we were, um, we've dealt with different challenges with having a baby, um, buying a house, opening the restaurant and losing my caring for and losing my mother all in the same that first year. Um, my daughter had some health problems that um, still dealing with now. And um, we were just constantly faced with one big challenge after another. Um, and they kind of happen very quickly. And some are good and some are bad and some are sideways and some last a long time and some last a short time. So in knowing that all of them, pass, you know, they, they, they subside or we adjust to those problems, um, they're not necessarily a problem anymore. A problem is something that you can't solve. And so, you know, the health issues and my mother, like those types of things are more um, foundational and not necessarily something that we can fix per se, but we can do what we can do. You know, we heal people or not heal them or heal ourselves. Um, but with restaurant work, that was more tangible. That's not a problem. So we don't have staff, okay. So we're now modifying our business because we don't have as much staff in the kitchen. So we need to adapt, right? And adapt the business to work for it. We get closed down for coronavirus and we have to we have to figure out how to make a new business model, right? It's it's not necessarily a um, it's a problem. It's how do you work through this situation? So, bringing us to this past year, um, we were closed. We didn't have a takeout business. Um, so many restaurants with takeout businesses did very well. They were able to um, continue running business as usual offering takeout. Um, we had been turning away takeout for six years because we weren't able to accommodate it in the summer. We never really built it through the winter. It wasn't our strength. Our food is very, um, we use fresh ingredients. It's not the same as many dishes that hold up well for takeout. Um, so this was a very big challenge. So adapting our menu and changing the way we were making our food was something that we had to figure out how to do in order to accommodate takeout. So through that, um, that was found through um, our willingness to listen to ideas from other people. Um, someone had reached out to me that I really don't know her. Like, it's not someone, I, honestly, I can't think of her name right now, but she gave me a bit of wisdom and a tip that um, has really, it was, I was open to listening to it and it was a great idea and it shifted our entire trajectory. Um, this woman had suggested, what about raising, I heard about someone raising money for um, donations. And I, it just, it was just a simple thing that she had mentioned. She called, this woman called me out of the blue to tell me this idea she had. And her vision may have been a little bit different, but for me, it just clicked into something of, ah, I know what we can do with that. I have very good friends um, that I can connect with. I have a good relationship, a longstanding relationship with Hunterdon Healthcare, you know, Kathleen Seelig is a very good friend of mine. <laughs> She's not on here today, but I wish she was. Um, you know, I can connect with the healthcare system. I can connect with the community. And we were able to figure out how to start raising um, money for donations to make meals for frontline workers. It didn't make money, but it kept us going. It paid for our staff. It was able to keep us continuing moving forward. because so we didn't know how long this was going. We didn't know what's the duration of this change. What do we do? Um, but it took a, it, it was able to just move one baby step, but then we came into the problem of making all these meals, but realizing our food was not good for takeout. So how are we going to make this work? And that's where we discovered 
making food cold, preparing meals with the intention to be reheated. So we've completely changed the way our cooking process. Instead of preparing food hot and serving it hot where it gets soggy in a takeout container and you reheat it, we've completely changed the way we're preparing our meals so that they're plated cold and they last longer and they could be reheated. And this all evolved through donating meals through to our frontline workers, to our first responders, because we were making such large quantities for certain days for large groups during this, you know, the first parts of the, the pandemic. And we were like, this is a better quality product. This is an interesting concept. It was just a total shift in what we'd been ever, it was, it's not really what restaurants do. It was, it was a different concept and, and a different way we had to set up our line, structuring our kitchen completely different in order to accommodate this. So we started trying to offer that type of meals through takeout. It was catching on a little bit. The people that tried it, they really enjoy it, but it was, it's, a different, it's a different concept that we have cold food. Since then, we found that we really like doing that. It, we found that there are parts of the restaurant we don't like, and through coronavirus and COVID, it, it, it was able to um, help us see what we enjoy doing and what we don't enjoy doing and what we could do more of in order to continue moving forward. Um, we really enjoy giving meals to um, people in need. And since then we've continued to donate meals be, since we have, we do receive some donations, but a lot of it's been our own initiative to continue providing meals. And now we give them to the Flemington Food Pantry. Um, and every week, I, I know Janine's on here today, Every week we make a trip to the Flemington Food Pantry to make a donation. And it's a twofold solution where we're not only helping those in need, we are also um, reducing food waste. So our food, it's not that it was bad food, but food that's prepared, if we prepare excess food, we're able to actually um, serve it for our community. So we plate it instead of, because we close for a certain amount of days, it just works out any of our remaining food, we're able to make meals and give it to, um, to our community. Um, that's something that we're passionate about, as well as continuing, um, we've continued the initiative of, um, or our excitement, I guess, of preparing meals cold. I, I fast forwarded a little bit when I started talking about the food pantry, so I apologize. <laughs> Backing up one step, we did open the clean plate. We continued um, serving takeout and we opened last patio season. Um, when we, we were opened on the patio, we had a successful summer, but it was really difficult. Um, much of the, the um, joy of the restaurant industry for us has, um, it's not there as much. And the business has changed in a way that um, it is not as fulfilling. Um, a busy Saturday night with me walking around, chatting with customers and um, or, you know, it, it's not the same experience um, with a mask standing six feet away um, when you're hot and uncomfortable and you're not sure if people want you near you or not. And um, every customer has had um, a different take or a different perspective when they dine with us. You're, you have a wide variety of different types of customers. Um, so you don't know what to expect or how to read someone or where you belong. And it, um, I don't want to say it hardened us, but it, it changed. It, it made us look at what do we enjoy doing and how do we reinvent ourselves to do more of what we enjoy doing. And what we enjoy doing is cooking. We enjoy um, creating, I especially enjoy creating new menus and new recipes. And we enjoy serving our community and we enjoy um, providing for those in need. And those are all things that we are actually currently doing. We created a new business model um, after patio season was over opening inside, we realized we don't have that same sustainability that we had worked so hard to create to get customers to wanna to come inside and dine with us inside and in our restaurant. We have a small space, it's an older building. It, our customers are not necessarily comfortable eating out, that like this does not make sense if numbers and dollars wise and our, our mental health, <laughs> the hours that we would be putting in, the finances, it doesn't, 
add up to something that works to be fulfilling or, you know, in any aspect of the word. So we reinvented ourselves to actually create Feel Good Food at Home, which is a new business model that we've been offering since October. And um, we're really excited about it. We thought that this was something that we could easily transition to, um, but it's proving to be challenging. <laughs> Um, there's different logistics issues as far as um, delivery, packaging. Um, there's issues, ordering now is completely online. So we're ordering, customers are ordering remotely. It's a different um, credit card processing. The websites have been, we've been through two websites since October and the current one we have is actually proving to be rather, have some downfalls. So we may be moving to a third model by next fall. Um, so it just, it, it, um, the challenges were there, but we've, we've been finding the parts that we enjoy. So we're continuing to be able to look at those and continue to move forward. Now, here we are at, it's May. And um, as you can see, there's some tropical background here. <laughs> that's real, that's authentic. Um, so if we look at silver linings within and through the choices that we've made, um, there, there are some. So my daughter was, she has a club foot and she had a relapse of her club foot and she's, she just turned five years old. And so we, um, we're in Florida right now for a specialist that he's, um, he was treating her in St. Louis and he actually just moved to Florida and he's 10 minutes from my in-laws, which there's nowhere else in the world where I could go and be more fully supported. It's, it's amazing that I'm able to be here. Um, she had surgery. She's been in a, a long leg cast for nine weeks and she just had her cast removed this week and we just started rehab and she, she turned five during this time. We had her birthday. Meanwhile, I'm working <laughs> full time, um, managing feel good food at home and running the website and preparing to open our patio this week <laughs> while my husband's going back and forth. Um, so it, it's been a trying time, but there's also been so many blessings. I've worked more this past year than I have ever. Um, and when my husband and I work a lot, we, um, our, kids, our kids are the thing that we end up putting in uh, a babysitter or you know, a, a daycare or different, we're passing them around and feel like we're not truly spending time with them. And this experience and my daughter's foot needing this attention forced us to stop and realize this is this is the thing. This is this is the most important thing that needs our attention. And how do we make our life work for this that we can still do the things that we enjoy business wise? But this is my job. <laughs> like I'm really good at this one, being a mom. I can still work. I'm good at that too. But caring for this need is a priority. She requires. Um, for daily physical therapy, um, stretching multiple times a day. She's wearing a brace on her leg. She's relearning how to walk. This isn't over, you know, there's, there's a lot more loop for this. So talk about um, reinvention, resilience, finding the silver lining. Well, I found my daughter again and I, and it's, we've, she's, enjoyed this time so much. And my other daughter, my two-year-old is actually now here with me now that she's doing much better. Um, so managing two kids on my own and <laughs> trying to manage uh, work with my husband away from me, trying to do all of his work. Um, it's been hard, but we've, I've been able to take away that um, letting work become the number one priority. And I'm setting time where it's like, this is my work time and this is my family time. And we're gonna go do something special right now. And I'm not perfect at it. Um, I definitely let work um, win more often than I care to admit. Um, but we've been able to continue to just mold this situation into something that was a good one. We've, you know, we've made little mini trips and we, you know, we make sure we make special meal times and we do little things, you know, it's not a lot, but little crafts that we've, you know, we've done more crafts than you can imagine in the last couple of months. And I love it. You know, it's, it's been something that I, I don't see it as a, um, 
a bad thing that's happened. You know, this was a decision that we made that she's, it's going to better her for her future. She is going to run, she is going to walk, you know, it's going to take us a little while to get there. And we're grateful to have had the opportunity to have a doctor um, here to, to care for her. If this was last year and the restaurant was open and we were opening patio season, I don't know how I would have made this decision. I don't know that, I don't know if we would have looked at it clearly or the same. I'd like to think we would have, but I don't, I don't know that. I, I think the restaurant would have been our main priority. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that shifting gears and shifting priorities doesn't make it um, a bad thing. It doesn't make it a failure. I'm not afraid to fail at something that we're trying to do. Um, I recognize that we just keep it evolving and resiliency is about just evolving and adapting to the changes and looking at them and seeing the silver linings. I'm not a um, overly optimistic over the top. I think it's more about realistic and having perspective about life and looking at things and say, okay, let's look at this realistically and how can we shift this into something that is positive for us in the long term. And returning back to the faith of um, that inner self, that higher self, wherever you may find that, um, and just remembering that you can come back to that. Bringing my daughter here for this surgery was one of you know those up those times where I was facing true fear, you know, and it was petrifying fear. And how are we going to manage all of the moving pieces? It was you know really scary. And here we are. We're almost done. I'm going to be home in a week and a half. You know, it's been it's been a couple months and we haven't really spoken about it. It's, you know, we haven't made a big deal of where we are, or what I'm doing, um, but we've been able to keep it going for this entire time because we've been able to um, just keep moving with the punches and adapting. You know, self-care has been a really important part of this as well. It's easy to lose ourselves when we're faced with adversity. And remembering that in returning to ourself, the way we find it is through often with self-care. And for me, it's just, it's been little things like reading. I'd mentioned earlier that I, I've been reading fiction books. I mean, to me, that's like pre, uh, pre uh, before this, I think of that as like a waste of time. Like I'm supposed to be reading a self-help book or something about nutrition or a cooking book or some other business book. And I've been reading like just fiction like some of it's been just kind of like cheesy books that I've completely 100% enjoyed and it just, it relaxed me. And I was like, you know what? Okay, I did that. <laughs> I'm gonna keep doing it. I like it. And walking, I, you know, I, I get out walking, I can push my daughter in the stroller. And that's something that, so I'm not by myself. I don't get to take long, luxurious baths. It's not like, you know, self-care is different in whatever situation you're in, but I am able to like get out and get moving my body and breathe and get some exercise. and feel better about myself. And for you, it, you know, it's wherever you find that way of just providing some small um, self-care to yourself. And I think another thing to, to remember is to, um, when you continue to maintain purpose, so when you're faced in something difficult, if you can keep moving forward and doing um, things purposely, and whether it's that you're helping someone else, you're helping yourself, um, it helps to just keep moving forward through these difficult situations. And, you know, it's, your story is not the same as mine, obviously. We all have different challenges. And I think in resiliency, trauma is something that we all have experienced in different ways and we respond to it differently. And it doesn't matter how big or how small it is or how it's perceived to someone else. It's very individual how we adapt to that but it's about being able to um, find a way to grow through it and take that opportunity as a learning opportunity. And there, of course, we, we still feel the pain, we feel the struggle, we feel the fear, but if we can work through it versus, you know, and we may need to take pauses, but if we can grow through it and continue to move forward, we, um, we just, it better prepares us for the next time there's a different adverse situation um, that we have to continue to grow through.
Miss, am I doing okay on time? Am I done? You're doing great, Nicole. Um, great. And am while I, I just want to say thank you on, on two things, but while I do that, I want to invite anybody who has questions to put them in the chat because we do have time for two or three questions, if that's okay with you, Nicole. Oh yeah, that's okay. Okay. Um, and I want to thank you first of all for, um, you know, for sharing the messy. Um, I think we're not particularly good at that. Um, I will admit my role as a business owner, mother, chief operating officer of a household. Sometimes I feel like I'm a camp counselor that has to be mm -hmm. happy, happy, happy. Is everybody happy? And um, you know, to hear you speak and give us not only the permission but almost a command to um, to say no, no, mm -mm, we can be messy. Let's get you know, let's get messy. So thank you for that, and also thank you for sharing your thoughts on doing what you love, because I think, you know, that phrase, do what you love. If you're doing what you love, it's not work is like a refrigerator magnet. And for you to bring that to life, the way that you have um, through your story is really very genuine and very inspirational. So I just want to thank you for that. And um, if there is anyone who has a question for Nicole, either put it in the chat or raise your hand. Well, um, Colleen, with social media has been one of those things that because everything's virtual, there's a lot of time spent on social media. And a lot of, I think that I'm often maybe perceived as very well, um, I don't, it's not a word I use towards myself, but perfect or like, heck, I have everything together and everything's all like, that's not real. <laughs> I might be making progress and doing okay, but that's that's work, Nicole. That's social media. That's part of the business perspective that's important. And I do try to share little bits of my personal self, but tonight, today, talking about um, some of the ugly parts of it and admitting that to you, I mean, I was very um, on the fence about whether to do it, but I think when you when you face a challenge and you face that adversity and knowing that someone else has that depth to them and that they've experienced it and they're on the other side of this, or maybe have overcome many little things or big things. Um, I think it gives you the strength to feel like I can do it too. And um, I hope it does. I hope, I hope it helps to give a little more like, Oh, wait, that's, there's more than what I thought there. Oh, okay. I can relate to that. And, Oh, I've had that feeling before. And okay. I, I guess maybe there's another way or maybe, you know, I, I hope that that, you know, in sharing a personal part was something that I, I hope provides more um, depth just to the professional aspects because they are so intermingled. And as women, we, a lot of us are mothers, a lot of us are spouses or partners or, you know, we have a lot of other pieces to us and um, it's, you can't really compartmentalize it always. It's, it gets all intermingled. It's part of us, right? It's part of caring about something that you're doing. For sure. And um, I just want to share that um, we had a couple of comments in the chat. Thank you for being so much for sharing your story and being so vulnerable. You are very inspiring. Uh, that's from Jill. Marianne says, thank you. Nicole, your story resonates with me. Keep moving forward through difficult challenges, adapt and grow through. And you said that twice, Nicole, by by the way, you know, grow through a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, your story is inspiring, bravo, um, relatable. Um, Janine says, not a question, but if I think about one of the positives of the pandemic, it would be the transition of my relationship with Nicole from loving her restaurant, and I am with you on that, Janine, to loving her. Um, and isn't that the ultimate compliment? Well said. I've been along the path to reinvention, um, been along on her path to reinvention this year, and she's amazing. It's been a struggle, but she has kept moving forward. Um, and Karen says, your adaptability, creativity, and strength is inspiring. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then Marianne says, also, as you said in the beginning, LOL, I have a difficult time public speaking. <laughs> um, and P.S., your speech was perfect. So you get a you get applause from Mary Ann's and I agree. I agree. I think you did a terrific job, Nicole. I know you were um, wondering about whether to have slides, no slides. And I think your approach of just talking to us was so um, really well done and um, so genuine. And I think we all really appreciate that. Thank you. I wish I could give you all a hug and feel you. <laughs> like it's hard on these little like boxes of where to look and who am I looking at, but thank you. Thank you for having me today. Well, we welcome, we look forward to welcoming you back in person. What do you say, folks? Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, yeah. Come next week, we are opening in person. We are opening 
um, this weekend on our patio. So we are just adding another layer of complexity. I've, I've hired 25 to 30 front of the house people virtually, and I'm setting up trainings through like Facebook posts. And um, it's definitely a big one trying to figure out all the pieces. Fortunately, I have some good help at home and Anthony has been doing a lot of the physical stuff while I'm doing all the, the menus and planning and yeah, is our heads are spinning while we, yeah, figure this well, out. I'm so, yeah. I'm so glad you're doing what you love. It's, it's nice to hear that. And, um, and I will give a, um, unabashed endorsement because you talk about how your food is nutritious and healthy and gluten-free and all those things. It is phenomenal food. Uh, it is really delicious. There is something for everyone at your place and in your food, um, even for the biggest skeptic and carnivore. So <laughs> I encourage everyone. We are hiring in our kitchen. We are like, we actually can't open to capacity because we cannot, we have gotten zero applicants, zero for our kitchen position. So I'm just going to put it out there. If anyone happens to know anyone, we're willing to train someone that's willing to work. We are like, desperate for we're looking for several kitchen people two more because we're expanding from feel good food at home to feel good food at home and clean plate kitchen i've never experienced this like zero applicants for our kitchen it, it's unbelievable the um change in front of a house we've got lots of kids like younger staff than we normally hire but we're adapting in our menu and our ordering to be able to um have a younger staff because that's mostly what we've been getting but um i do need kitchen help <laughs> okay <laughs> all right well um i want to thank you and um mary from wolverton and are you on would you like to um we know you have a, a gift for nicole would you like to uh present that virtually i'm not sure if mary's able to speak um, well, we do have a gift certificate to the Wolverton Inn compliments of Mary and the Wolverton Inn for you as a thank you for sharing your story and sharing your time, especially in this chaotic season and time of your life. We are so grateful to you for giving giving us your time and your story. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Got to go back to New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, look, we'll see you soon. Um, and to our um, participants, I want to thank you for joining today. We are gonna give you a five minute break. I encourage you to um, put yourself on mute before you do that. Um, so we will be back here in five minutes at 9.30 and we will welcome our next speaker, Megan McDowell. So thanks again, Nicole, virtual high fives. Thank, yep, you. thank you and we'll see you all in five minutes. Thank you again, Nicole, and you're welcome to stay on if you if you can. Thank you. Nicole, are you able to stay on for a little bit after Megan's speech just to have yeah. a little back and forth? Yeah, I'm going to say until my um, my children come and are screaming in the background. That's fine. Well, you know, let's being watched. Real. Don't worry, they're, in, they're being cared for by my in-laws. That's real life, Nicole. It's it's all good, you know, because my dog could decide that somebody's come by to murder me again. So, right. you know, welcome to the yeah. life of Zoom and virtual. I'll stay and hang out. I know I'm not as experienced on virtual. I've been doing real life. <laughs> and now this whole remote thing is like been a steep learning curve for me. <laughs> but yeah. All part of the yeah. fun. Growth opportunity, learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Well, I, you know, again, I really appreciate you sharing your, your, um, I guess, you know, your, your messy, mm -hmm. you know, I think we, we have a tendency to put on the brave face and make sure everybody else is okay. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think it's a fear of, and certainly in my case, a fear of passing my um, anxiety onto someone else and they don't need that right now. So mine's about being perfect. Awesome. Really, yeah. really, really beautiful. Thanks, Megan. Really, well, I look forward to seeing yours. I just, I really appreciate that, all that you shared. It really, uh, yeah, it's you being you and I don't even know you, <laughs> but um, there's just such a power in showing up the way that you just did. Really. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I have to say, I, I'm always grateful when presenters and authors and anyone who's giving content um, shares the, and it, maybe it's a failure, maybe it's a vulnerability, maybe it's a mistake, um, because I find that that is so much more genuine and believable. And that's how we learn, isn't it? We you learn. Know, if, yeah. Right. And so, you know, I've read books and heard people speak and they talk about all the fantastic things they've done and how everything's gone right. And I just always have that nagging feeling of, oh, come on. You kind of hate so, that. <laughs> well, I don't believe it. I, I don't believe anybody can, can navigate through decades of personal and professional life and not, and not stumble or fall. I think that's where, you know, that growth that I was talking about, that's how we kind of, I don't want to say level up, but it's how you get to that next challenge, that next big thing is because you worked through it, you know, you can either regress and self-destruct or kind of go, okay. It seems like those, those lessons seem to keep popping up until we face it that same yeah. lesson in different ways over and over again. So yeah, it's true for sure. Another. And sometimes you look back and go, wow, it was really sloppy, but yeah. I get so it hard. now. Yeah. Did yeah. I have to, that's a hard lesson. Did yeah. I have to go through? Yeah, exactly. Did I get it that way? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got in a text message or something. Right. And it wasn't on my timeline. It wasn't convenient. Never. The people involved were not my first choice. Yep. <laughs> well, I, I do have to <laughs> add in there. We picked it. <laughs> can, can you guys hear me? I don't have my video yeah. on because I'm on my, ahead, my cell phone instead of my laptop. I'm on my laptop at the same time as on my cell phone here. But um, we were planning, we we're trying to find a lot of like outdoor eating places to have our meetings now. And of course, the clean plate as a favorite is like, oh, we're going to meet there. We're going to meet there. And this has been going on a couple of weeks. And we, we were looking and it's not open and we're like, what are they doing? And there was so much judgment. And uh, I was just like, I don't know what they're thinking. Are they crazy? Why wouldn't they be open? This is a perfect opportunity. So being able to hear the story and that the rawness of it, of course, you know, like I feel so, well, not truly, but there, there's that guilt of like, oh, I judged her so wrongly. Um, but if we weren't open and vulnerable and raw like this, then how would we know what's going on with somebody else? How, if we don't hear these stories, how do how do we go to a place of empathy, of sympathy, of of um, courtesy, of decency, and every you know? So so hearing this story just really helped me understand is like, wow, you know what? She's human. I'm human, and I want to be treated honorably if i'm going through something like we've all gone through something with covid this this year and everything but just the whole story i didn't know she had children i didn't know you know like i didn't even see a person i just saw a business i just i just like looked at it like this business and you think of the you know oh corporate and and money and and no excuses but then to to be to be you know, like just like one of us in our community, this is, it's so nice. It was a very warming, wonderful way to start my Friday. So thank you so much for sharing and for doing that, that, that I, I wrote in the chat that Brené Brown is the one who came up with it, who, who popularized the, the concept of being vulnerable and what that brings to the table is, is bigger and better than, than just like, Colleen's talking about the sloppiness of it. We shouldn't be ashamed. We we should be able to have a platform where we can say, you know what, I'm human and I'm I'm not perfect. I'm not a machine, and and things are messy. So, <laughs> but well, I thank it. you I for that, Don. Yeah, she makes I, messy look gorgeous, doesn't she? Though, <laughs> like yeah. if that's what messy. 
you know, holding it all together, but I know inside how that stuff feels. So yeah, I agree with you, you, Dawn. And that's a great segue. Thank you for saying that. Um, uh, so folks, we are coming back from break and we're um, getting ready to um, introduce our next speaker. But before we do that, I'd like to, um, if I could just take a pause as Chris mentioned at the very beginning, I'm Colleen Durham, the chair of the Women's Business Forum, who's hosting the summit today. Um, and with that, I want to give a shout out to our founder, Ann Thornton, who was the inspiration behind the committee and behind the summit. But I also want to thank the committee. And I know um, a bunch of our folks are on the call today. Um, Dawn, Mary, Erin, Michelle, Nicole, and then, of course, Chris and Anna from the chamber, who um, work so tirelessly and truly behind the scenes. They do so much work to make these events a success. And for that, I'm grateful to them and to the entire committee. So I want to thank everyone. Um, and with that, I want to quickly introduce um, Aaron DeGeorge. Aaron is a senior partner and family law attorney with uh, uh, DeTaurus and DeGeorge. And she is here to introduce our next speaker and she's also a committed member of this committee. So thanks, Aaron. And with that, I'm gonna flip it over to you. Gotta unmute myself, but uh, thank you very much, Colleen. And I'm happy, you know, I'm thrilled to be here. And Nicole, you were fantastic. And um, I agree, the food is delicious and you feel so good after you eat it because you know you ate something really great and healthy. So definitely go the clean plate. But um, I'm very excited to announce our next speaker and that's Megan McDowell. And Megan is the founder of HeartWorks, a 501c3 acts of kindness group for women. HeartWorks replicates the connection and transformative acts that Megan witnessed while living at her sister's home for six weeks after her brother-in-law, John Farrell was killed while working in the South Tower on September 11th of 2001. As a licensed therapist and visionary, she shares her understanding that the connection we are all craving comes from going inward with our own personal life wounds and then giving outward from this place to others. Her presentation inspires uh, groups of people to live with more purpose and less distraction, similar to the way we were all living in the months following September 11th. Megan has been featured in numerous publication media outlets and national television programs. Megan McDowell is a sought after public speaker and blogger, guiding people to use their own life experiences to bringing healing to the world around them. So welcome, Megan. <laughs> do I do something? No. You're good, Megan. I'm good? Okay. Am I on? You are on, yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, this is just so different than being in person, isn't it? Even after all this time. Um, hold on, just give me a second here with this so I can see everybody. Okay, that's better. So what Aaron didn't mention is that Aaron is my first cousin. So isn't that the best to have your cousin introduce you? So thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. You very much. <laughs> Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I would love to start with a nice deep breath together. There's such a power in connecting us through our breath. So everybody just together, let's just start with a nice deep breath. Nicole, thank you so much for just opening with so much, um, wisdom, truly. And, um, yeah, and vulnerability. It really, there's such a palpable feeling to, uh, for each other, even especially over Zoom when someone just opens up. And so thank you for that. Um, it was really, it was just awesome to hear your story, truly. So thank you. Um, so again, my name is Megan McDowell. I'm a licensed therapist and I live in Bernardsville, New Jersey. And I have a foundation called HeartWorks and HeartWorks, like Aaron said, was started um, out of an awakening, something that happened in my life through the events of 9-11. And when we talk about being resilient, the funny thing is the group that I started called HeartWorks, which I'll tell you about um, as I speak, um, I guess can go under the umbrella of being resilient, that we had this really 
horrific thing happen in our family. And through the resiliency process, um, HeartWorks came to be. But what's so interesting about it is that when people say to me, you know, you kind of made lemons out of lemonade and, and you're so res resilient and this is this wonderful thing that you did, I don't really see it that way because it saved my life. So the connection that has been created through HeartWorks, the opportunity to be get out and talk to people about being resilient and the unpredictability of life. Um, it's just not something as I view of something that even should be revered or respected because it's really life-saving for me. Um, it's how it, it's gotten me through some of the hardest parts in my life is um, going out and talking about it. So, um, so to backtrack a little bit, um, HeartWorks is an organization that started about, well, we've been five years now. So I guess it started five years after 9-11. So it is a acts of kindness group for women. And what we have done for the past 15 years is helped local families when they are going through acute illness or tragedy, illness, grief, tragedy, we can step in and help walk somebody's dog while they're in chemotherapy, um, give a family a trip to Florida after their young father died. Um, if somebody's house burns down, we can do collections and help them rebuild their lives. So what it is, is it's an acts of kindness group helping people in the first acute months of loss and tragedy in a similar way to the way we all behaved after 9-11. So, bringing us to 9-11. Um, on 9-11, my brother-in-law, John Farrell, was 41. He was working in the South Tower. And my sister, Mary Ann, had dated John Farrell since they were 16. So he had really been in my family since I was seven or eight. And they both went to Bernard's High School together in Bernardsville, King and Queen of the Prom. Um, and they really, I think if you ask anybody who knew them, they were the couple that you just hope to God that you found that kind of love in your life. You know, I remember when people, when I was young and people would say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I would say, I want to be in love like Marianne and John, and I want to help people. And thank God that has happened for me because that was something that I think I started manifesting even unconsciously when I was very, very little. Um, so John and Marianne dated all through high school, all through college, got married about, I think, two years after college. They had four children. They were living in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Um, and on 9-11, John left for work on a sunny, beautiful morning. And I was living in, in um, Lafayette, Colorado with my husband. I was a couple of months pregnant with my second daughter. My first daughter was two. And we were actually flying that day on September 11th um, to come home to throw a surprise birthday party, a 30th birthday party for my younger sister. There's four of us in my family. And my older sister, Marianne, and I were planning this surprise party for my younger sister. And I was feeding my daughter, Madison, um, yogurt. And I had just put a spoonful of yogurt in her mouth. And by the time I scooped down to get the next bite, my brother called me on the phone from Chicago, said, do you have the news on? I said, I don't. He said, um, put it on because that's John's building. Um, you know, I think anybody of a certain age remembers, right? And it was in that moment that I knew life as I knew it was over. I was a therapist. I had sat with people for a few years at that point, um, going through hard things, working with people through transition. So I knew enough about life to know that life would come back, but damn it, I didn't want it to change right? I didn't want it to change. I really loved the way that things were. Um, my family was really intact before this had happened. 
with John and we had really not been through any significant loss in our immediate families. And um, when John was missing those first couple of days, it was just that moment that everyone on this Zoom call knows when your life is one way one minute and another the next. And what it takes to live through that and to tolerate that, those feelings. So a story which is a whole nother bottle of wine is that we got in the car, we drove back on this epic cross country trip. Um, you know, we had to drive back from Colorado. It took us two, um, two days. And I said to my daughter who was two at the time, Madison, I said, sweetheart, you have to sit in the car seat for two days. And I said, I know that you are not old enough to understand but we are in a moment in time right now where we just have to completely depend on God. We have to depend on the invisible force in our life to get us through moment to moment. And right now, for the next two days, what I need you to do is sit in this car seat. And I opened myself up to any invisible force that could help at the time. And I just prayed and said, please, God, have her be manageable in this car trip. We were with my father because my father had been in California uh, visiting a friend. He jumped in a car, rented a car from California, met my husband and I and my daughter at um, Denver Airport. And the four of us got in the car to drive back, to finish the drive back home. I will say that the first acts of kindness that I became aware of after 9-11 was that my father, was in California looking for a rent-a-car so that he could come and pick us up and head home. John's missing at this point. And my father would tell the story that he was in line for a rent-a-car. And when he got up to the, to the counter, he said, I need a rent-a-car. And they said, there's no more cars. We're out. You're going to have to figure out another situation. And my father said, my son-in-law is missing. And I need a car to get back east. And the man in front of him turned around and handed him the car keys to give my father the car. So that for me, which you'll learn about in a little bit, that was like the first um, instance of 9-11 connection that I became aware of. And of course, at the time I was in a fog, I didn't know what that was. You know, so we get in the car, we come back, speed through the story a little bit. I'm at my sister's house for six weeks. Um, we are from an Irish Catholic, Irish Catholic over a meshed family. So when something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us and we all get in there and we're all fixers and we have very little toleration for each other's discomfort. Um, so you talk about a mosh pit of love, um, we were in it. And so for six weeks, I lived at my sister's house in Basking Ridge. And I was crushed. My siblings were crushed. My sister was catatonic. <laughs> um, she had four children from the ages of like 12 to three. Um, they were confused and upset and everything was so disorienting. <laughs> John's family was upset. My parents were upset. It just, it felt like everywhere I turned, everybody was a mess. And this really interesting thing about 9-11, which I've come to learn over the course of my life and, and now that I'm older and have gone through more losses, is one of the really unique things about 9-11 is that the outside matched our insides. So meaning we couldn't function and yet when we looked outside, other people couldn't function. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget this one time I said to the girl, to um, the four kids, I said, let's just sit down and watch the Yankees game. This was like the week following. I said, let's just sit and watch the Yankees game. Give us, give ourselves a little distraction. And we sat down to watch the Yankees game and the Yankees game was canceled. And my niece, Caitlin, who was 12, looked at me and she said, "Is are the Yankees not playing because of what happened to daddy? And I said, yes, sweetheart, the Yankees aren't playing because of what happened to daddy. And I thought about how many families, and I saw this when my father died a few years later, 
you're having this internal experience and yet the world is operating as normal. And that wasn't the case for 9-11. So I stayed at my sister's house for six weeks. I saw the hands of God reach out to us. It felt like, because it was true, from the moment we opened our eyes in the morning until the moment we closed them, the world was showing up for us. And what it was, was the invisible working through people. So when I say the invisible, that can be God in any form that you see that. Whatever energy, when I talk to people about this, whatever energy you believe creates the flowers and the clouds and the trees um, and the leaf, a leaf coming from a branch. For me, that's God. For me, that's that higher power. And what I witnessed was just that higher power sense of support coming through human beings delivering a, a lasagna. It was like God was delivering the lasagna is how my vision saw this. And people showed up for us. They showed up for the kids. They showed up for my sister. They showed up for my parents and John's parents and John's siblings in a way that truly saved our lives. And it felt like to me, anytime I would look and just say, how are we even gonna get through the next five minutes? Some, somebody would show up at the door and deliver a coffee or deliver, um, that was a good story. So one of Marianne's neighbors started to drop off two coffees every morning. And then somehow he must have gotten word that I don't drink coffee, but I'm a Diet Coke freak. Not anymore, I'm recovered. But at the time I was drinking a lot of Diet Coke and I would start first thing in the morning. So then all of a sudden it was a coffee and a Diet Coke showing up for us. And for the six weeks that I was at my sister's house, what I saw was the invisible support that exists for all of us coming through people and stayed there for six weeks, went back to Colorado for a couple of years. And then my husband and I, who both grew up in this area, we just wanted to get home. I just wanted to get back to my family. And so we moved back to Bernardsville and you know, I, I, I feel like some of you can relate to this, if not all of you, that once something like this happens, you are changed forever. When you have your own personal experience um, of life not being how you want it and the unpredictability of things that happen every single day. So I was kind of given this, this platform or this idea of being able to go out and, and talk about my experience with 9-11 and everyone had their own experience of that day. So that was that uniqueness that I didn't even have to explain the moment my family's life changed because everybody had experienced the same thing on one, one level or another. You may not have known somebody, but I think there's few people of a certain age that could say I wasn't affected by 9-11. That, that didn't shift anything for me. Um, and so for me, part of the resiliency was connecting in that place of common understanding. So again, I was a therapist. I've always been touchy-feely. I've always understood the invisible. You know, God is easier for me to talk about an experience than getting my laundry done. Um, I can talk about feelings until the cows come home, but I probably should have gone to ShopRite for milk three days ago. Can't seem to get myself there. Um, so this, for me, being the type of person I am, this feeler that I am, this always having this desire to connect with other people on the deeper level, 9-11 just kind of handed this to us on a silver platter because those weeks and months after 9-11, all illusions were dropped. There was no bullshit, if I can swear. There was no nonsense. You know, nobody a month after 9-11 cared what shoes they were wearing or what party they were invited to or what car they were driving. 
So all the illusions and all the masks dropped. So when Nicole is talking about that idea of being vulnerable and sharing our stories to create connection, that's what part of the issue with resiliency is, is that in order to be resilient, reach out for support. Let people know that you are on your knees so that they can help you with the resiliency. And so much of what happens, um, I think how we were kind of, um, how my, my talk was introduced was saying that you have two choices when the hard stuff happens. Um, and the hard stuff will happen and the hard stuff has happened and to everyone of a certain age. And the two choices as I see it is you can go in and shut down and isolate and live in fear, which sucks on top of the hard thing that's already happening. Or you can allow the brokenness to crack your heart open, to allow even more love into your life. I had a spiritual teacher in Telluride, Colorado in my 20s, Patty. And what she would say to me is allow your heart to keep cracking open and breaking. Because the more your heart breaks, the more love that comes in, the more support that comes in. So I got to the point after 9-11 and then a couple of years later when my father died, um, my father was someone that I loved like no other on the planet and he loved me back the same. And so when he left, um, even though I was an adult with children and, and married, it felt to me like my security had been taken away. Now, thankfully I had married a man who sees me in a similar way that my father did. So I, I still had some security in another human being on the planet and my mother as well, um, but I really missed my father. And so there's this idea of closing down when something happens, the why me, the why now, the why this. Why does that person get to have that life and I have this? Why does that person get to still stay alive? Or, you know, Nicole talking about her daughter. Why does another child not have to deal with issues with their feet and with their legs? And that is a place that you can go to, but it's very restrictive. And then in my experience, I'm adding hell to hell. Like I'm already in hell. And then I'm adding all this judgment on myself that I should be feeling better, or I should be better, or I should be over this by now, whatever those kind of self-critical stories that we tell each other, that hampers our resiliency. So the one choice is to let the hard things happen and have them close you and isolate you. Um, the other choice is to let them open you and let them expand you. And what I find is the more you talk to other people and the more I can get real about my own life and my own struggle and my own experience, guess what circles I create? I create circles of other people that get vulnerable and real about their experiences. And then I feel less alone. When I get open and vulnerable about the fact that I don't feel resilient and I'm on my ass today, the energy that you're creating when you share that pulls in other human beings to assist you in a way that cannot assist you when you're putting up a front. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, yeah. And so this idea of resiliency, um, I was pretty disappointed when I looked it up in the dictionary. I don't know if anybody else looked this up. My father was a, was a scholar and a word freak. And so he would actually, we went through a phase in our childhood that you had to learn a word a day. It did not help me as much on my SATs as he had hoped, but he would, you would sit at breakfast and he'd tell you some history facts so that you were, you know, understanding the sacrifices that the veterans were making for our country. And he would, um, he would say, you know, the more that you can learn and know things, the more we're honoring our American veterans and the, the sacrifices that people are making for us to have this nice life in Bernardsville. And part of what that was, was learning new vocabulary words. So when I looked up resilient, 
in the dictionary, it reads the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It means toughness. I don't know. I don't think that that's what being resilient means. <laughs> I'm so sorry to Webster's. The second um, definition was the ability of an object or substance to spring back into shape. So my issue with both of those, when you're talking about a, from a psychological and an emotional and a spiritual perspective is it's not about jumping back quickly and it's not about toughness. For me, it's about vulnerability and love and truth and taking as much time as you need during the process of being resilient. So sometimes being resilient means putting your feet on the floor. You can go out in your mind about your own personal life or your business, and this is what it would mean, and I got to do this, and if I was really who people think I am, I would be here, 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 and here. It's not about any of this stuff. It's about the bottom level, the core of just putting your feet on the floor in the morning. And that is part of being resilient is knowing yourself enough and honoring how hard life can be enough to let other people know when you need help being resilient. Um, I don't think it's about bouncing back quickly and I don't think it's about toughness. The second um, part that it says about an object, um, the ability of an object to sustain or substance to spring back into shape Elasticity is the word they use. I don't want to bounce back into shape. I want to just open up. I want to bounce, if we're going to use that phrase, to spring back. I don't want to spring back. I want to spring present. I want to spring into my life right now as it is, regardless of the mess it is. And one of the things that happened has happened with the pandemic, because I don't know if people have noticed this, I don't know if it's just coming from my perspective, but there are similarities between the pandemic and 9-11. There are similarities in the way that people um, are connecting with each other. And that's what my foundation is, that's what HeartWorks is, was that after I saw this level of connection and the power of a lasagna being delivered um, and what that can do for us, why are we waiting for the tragedies? So that was the whole point of starting HeartWorks was to say, let's just start behaving on like this. Let's just continue this. It was like, I was getting so nervous that the bath water was being thrown out with the baby, right? That when people started to go back to life. I want to go back to normal life. I was like, why? What was so great about that? Why don't we take what has happened, which is completely out of our control and completely devastating. And what if we open up more from that? What if we grow from that instead of going back? And isn't that where we are right now with the pandemic? Do you know, and I'm embarrassed to say this, that two weeks before, people are gonna to wanna to punch me when they hear this. Two weeks before the pandemic happened, I came out of my office, I'm a therapist in town, I come out of my office, I'm standing in the parking lot and I stopped and I put my face up to the sun and I was frustrated because people weren't behaving the way that I think they should behave. That's horrible, such judgment. And then I drive myself crazy because I want to change people and I can't change anybody other than myself. So I was frustrated. And I said, you know, God, it's like something has to happen to all of us at exactly the same time for people to get it. And two weeks later, we're on lockdown. So there was this really secret part of me told my husband about it, that as devastating as this pandemic has been, and I do not mean to say this to take away from any of the devastation and the loss, it, was, it is an opportunity that few people are given in their life. 
to experience devastation and have everyone on the planet in all different forms be going through the same thing. It is a spiritual gift of awakening and I do not want to waste it. And I have said to people, as judgy as this sounds, if you come out of this exactly the same as when you went in, you've missed something. Stay open. Stay open. Because the more we can heal ourselves, the more healed people there are out in the world. Truly. That's not just like a bumper sticker saying. The more we heal ourselves and we are being given an opportunity to be resilient in all different aspects of life. And remember for me, being resilient is continuing on despite what's happening. Because if hard stuff just started happening in the 80s, then I would say, hey, can somebody do something to stop this hard stuff? There's never not been hard stuff. In the history of the world, there has always been hard stuff. And, you know, if you've heard me speak before, I, I grew up with a father, we had, um, my father would always say, this is a very nice life, Megan. It's a very nice life. We live in a free country. We have a roof over our head. There's food in the refrigerator. We're all alive. We're being given another day. And I think my father got nervous when we moved to Bernardsville because he thought there was a lot of fluff and there was a lot of extra. My father always got a little squirrely in the fluff and the extra because he thought that it helped people to mask their lives and it cut down on true connection. And so my father, which I don't know, you could say it was brilliant, but it was also painful at the same time. My father would always remind me of the people who had less. My father would always remind us of the struggle. Um, the Holocaust was something that I would have high school friends sleep over. We'd wake up on a Saturday morning, probably hung over, go downstairs to sit. My mother would make us eggs and my father would talk to us about World War II, the Holocaust. Do we understand what people have given up to create this life for us? And so I grew up in a lot of intensity. But what that showed me was that the fluff does not sustain us the way the real stuff does. And so if you are struggling today with, oh God, they're going to be talking about resiliency. That is like the last thing I am. I don't even want to listen to these people because I don't feel resilient. You're up. And even if somebody that you know is in bed, maybe encourage them to sit up, encourage them to reach out and grab the phone, um, encourage them to share what's happening with them, with themselves, with another human being. Because for me, what resiliency is, it's showing up in your life for as it is, not how you wish it were. Because when you show up for how it is, whether right now it's that you're struggling with something in your family or something in your business, the first key to being resilient is getting real about what's actually happening in the moment instead of what you think should be happening or how you wanna be presenting yourself. That stuff just keeps you in isolation. So wherever you are in your struggle, which is also this, this really beautiful aspect of the pandemic is everyone is struggling. I always know everybody's struggling because I'm a therapist, so I sit with people all day. So when I'm in the grocery store, I'm never under an illusion that someone is walking through this life scot-free. But what has been so beautiful about the pandemic is that you can be in the grocery store and you, you have that eye contact again that we had after 9-11. When you say to somebody, how are you doing today? You're truly saying, how are you doing today? And then they say, how are you doing? And for somebody to look back at you and say, I'm really struggling. It's like, I get it. Not for, and for all different reasons, that's the other fascinating thing. There are some people that are needing more resiliency in their relationship, in their marriage, um, some in our parenting, some in our workplace. For most of us, it's all of those things. 
Um, and so please take this opportunity to know that resiliency is not something to strive for. Um, it's just about doing it. It's about putting one foot in front of the other and saying, what do I need to do right now to help regain some balance for myself? And that's being resilient. Um, you know, I consider myself a small business owner with this foundation. And I think all of us can understand that you've had to look at aspects of yourself and your life that um, were behind blinders before. There, there's things Nicole spoke to, the way she had to change her menu and the way she was doing it. It's like, oh my God, there's another way to do this? That's amazing. And for me, if you're like me, I fight that. I fight that change tooth and nail. I dig my heels in. I am not a, a creature of change. Um, I'm back in the house I was raised in. Um, I like things to stay the same. I do not like change and my foundation, like many people's businesses, we've had to shift and change. And so I can look at that and be afraid and be annoyed, or I can look at that and I say, I wonder what the other ways to do this are. I wonder what those things would be. And then to start looking at that and do not do it alone, reach out to other people and get that support. Because at the end of the day, we are all in this together. And if we went around this Zoom call right now, everybody has different characters and different storylines. But at the end of the day, it's all the same story. It's being alive on the earth um, in a world that can change on a dime, in a world that is not always seeing clearly and there's a lot of illusions that happen and our egos come up and get in the way of our relationships and our business goals, our fears come up. You know, Nicole said this beautiful, you used a word intermingle, Nicole, when you were speaking and you said how our family lives and our work life and, and it all intermingles. I'm going to add that our childhood intermingles, our childhood experience, our, our past, um, what has happened to us. And you know, for you to think that your childhood stuff doesn't rise to the surface in your professional life, is just not true. I wish I could tell you it was, but in every, in every interaction that we're happening, having our unhealed stuff is a part of our storyline. And so that's back to, um, you know, in, for Heartworks, part of what we do is we give to people, um, in acute tragedy, in acute illness and grief. But a whole nother part of our tagline is to look inward. We ask everybody to look inward and give outward because the more we're looking inward, the cleaner we can give, the cleaner our relationships are, the cleaner um, our business is. Because if you're running a business based on fear, if you're running a business on you know, you were never seen as a child. And so you're going to put yourself in the forefront of your business to be seen until you deal with the actual inner issue. The outside is never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. And that's the beauty that I see in my private practice and that I see um, at Heartworks when we're doing yoga together, when we're meditating together, when we're praying together. Um, and I've had, you know, I've had people say, well, I just want to come and give. I'm not really interested in the looking inward. And I say, then I don't know if we're the group for you. Because I'm not interested in chaotic giving, which is what we do so often as women. And I have part of my COVID awakening has been that I can be a chaotic giver. I can be a person who's giving and doing and not being still enough with my own chaos. And I'm actually doing some shifts like Nicole is doing a bit of a different menu setup. Um, we're shifting things around in my foundation because, you know, for women, we're givers and we're doers and we're fixers. How many fixers do I have on this Zoom call? Do we have some fixers out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's such a beautiful trait, but it's such a distorted trait too. Truly, truly. Um, so that was for me was I didn't want to start a foundation that was just about women showing up and giving because we do that naturally. 
What I wanted to do was start a foundation that had equal dynamics of looking inward and also giving outward. Um, and that's what, that's what HeartWorks is. And, you know, so the hope in, in staying with us for this long through these two presentations um, is truly for everyone to just give yourself a break today, truly. Um, you know, you're being resilient by waking up in the morning and showing up. That's resiliency, is to keep going. Um, and do not do it alone. Do not do it alone. And do not be afraid, I will be bold to say, do not be afraid of what is rising up to the surface. It can be so scary and it can feel unmanageable, but that's when you get help. Go see a good therapist, read a, support, uh, read a self-help book, follow people online that are talking about um, awakening and self-awareness and flood your media feed with affirmations and support. Um, you know, I don't follow anyone on my feed that doesn't make me feel good. There's enough things in my life that don't make me feel good about who I am. Why am I following voluntarily on my feed people and business models that are not making me feel good? So truly um, take care of yourself and put yourself in the mix, put your experience in the mix. If you're a business owner and the business needs some resiliency factors, know that you already have that in you. You just have to tap into it. There's nothing outside that is gonna help your business. It's gonna come from inside. And then of course, there are the tactical and practical things that you need to do to make that happen. But the real work is internally giving yourself a break, being patient with yourself, being open and honest with the people that are around you that can support you. My only last thing that I'm going to say about going to other people for support is stop going to the dry wells. Stop it. Stop going to the dry wells for water. I love it that I have like zero dry wells in my life. Because if you keep going to the dry wells for water, there is no water. And then it goes back on you that you're not enough and you're not doing it right. Find full wells. Find people in your life that love you and support you um, and pull from them, truly. So I think that's what I have to say about resiliency. I hope thank that, that you. was enough and time-wise it was okay. Yeah, you did great, Megan. Thank you so much for, um, I, I mean, again, just for being vulnerable. I think that was very powerful and, the, and it, it played so beautifully with um, Nicole's presentation. And um, if anyone has, I, what I'd love to do with the two of you, if you don't mind staying for another 10 minutes or so, is just, sure. I have a couple of questions for both of you. And, and if anyone out there has questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get them in as well. But Megan, what I appreciate about you is um, two things. One, your foundation and you are very focused on, you know, I think when people go through things, whether it's per personal or professional, the temptation we all have is to say, well, call me if you need me. And what you've done is push past that and said, look, I, I'm a homeowner. I know my lawn needs to be done. And now I know that person can't do that right now. So um, I, I just, I think that is so incredibly um, powerful and valuable. So thank you for bringing that to the fore. But then adding on to that, the, your messaging about ask for help um, and, and, and that, um, you know, giving people the opportunity to help with very specific items. You know, if tragedy struck, um, I don't know when my filters need to be replaced in my home. So, you know, or somebody needs to be picked up from there, you know, just those very specific things. I think that's really powerful. So thank you for, for sharing all of that. Um, had some wonderful comments in the chat. Um, thank you to both for being vulnerable and sharing your stories of overcoming challenges and giving us all hope. This has been a very profound conference. I agree with you, Rocky. Um, and Jennifer says, I try to remember to enter each hard place with curiosity, not dread. It takes practice. That's a really good lesson. Um, you know, Melissa says, thank you for your heartfelt presentations. Um, and Tamiko, so wonderful. Thank you for the impact. And, um, and everybody just seemed to just really appreciate the messages. So 
Um, what I'd love to do is, is ask both of you just a few questions. Um, and the first one is, you both talked a lot about your personal lives and your personal challenges, but yet how they intertwined professionally. And given that we are the Chamber of Commerce and we are a business focused entity, if you could take that sentiment, that interplay um, and give us um, what would be your top three things on a health check, on a business professional health check, or what would be the top three things in your toolkit that you would recommend um, when you consider those two things coming together? You go first, Megan. You want me to go first? <laughs> I would say off the top of my head that I could probably answer if I had more time to think about it, but my, um, my gut instinct is to say, stop trying to reinvent the wheel. There have been people that have gone before you. Um, and so reach out to other people that are in a similar business um, that have a similar mindset and get support from them. I would say my second thing would be to start your day in quiet. Watch yourself. If you are waking up and the first thing in the morning is the panic thoughts about the emails you didn't send and what you need to do that day at the shop. And you are, before your feet even hit the floor, you're already in that dynamic of speed with your business. Find a way to quiet yourself, whether that's meditation or getting out of the bed and doing some yoga moves. However, you connect to getting into your inner core to start your day at your business, I cannot overstate the importance of that, of staying present within your own self. Um, the third thing I would say is practicing gratitude of if you're waking up in the morning and you're already making the list of all the things that you haven't done for your business, start with the things that you have done. Start with gratitude for the building or for the ingredients for the food or for your business connections. It's gonna raise your vibration and lower the anxiety if you start your day and remind yourself all day of the things that you're doing that do work instead of all the deficiencies. Awesome. I think, I think Megan might be my like soul sister. We're like different <laughs> entities of like the same, like exactly like, you know, I, I would say support is so important. You know, finding that support for you professionally and personally, sometimes it's the same person. Sometimes I utilize um, people that work for me are my friends that maybe could help me in different capacities because I trust them and I know that they can support me in a different way. Not necessarily because they're, um, all of their skills line up to every checking the box, but because they provide something more to me that they know me, they know my needs, they understand it. I feel like that it's really important to have a few people like that, that you can go to, not just in your personal life, but professional or crossing over that they truly know all the ins and outs. Like even if it's one person, you just need that support that you can go to. And I would self-care, you know, that, that quiet voice is part of that self-care but finding a way, it's not, it, I think someone had made a mention of it and it's so true, it's not a luxury when you don't take care of yourself. You know, that saying, or if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. Um, as a mother, a lot of times, you know, we can lose ourselves or as a business owner or, you know, whatever aspect it might be, we forget that we are a person too, like we're doing all this nurturing. So try and treat yourself like you would to your best friend you know, because that's, that is your best friend is, is you really like loving ourselves. And let me think of one more. Faith is coming back to just faith and, and really just returning home to, to that inner voice and wherever you find that, that, that faith from nature, God, above, within, wherever that may be. It's, if your decisions for your business are made from that place, they're going to be more wholesome and they're going to be more successful and it's going to help you to, to flourish and, and get through whatever adversity, um, crisis, or just good joy too. And appreciating that joy by being able to come from that, that place of knowing. Thank you, thank you. Um, and again, if anybody, oh, Aaron has a question for Megan. Um, oh, oh, Aaron, what a great question. What advice do you have to live with more purpose and less distraction? Beautiful, beautiful. Oh. That's such a good question, Eric. 
Um, it is, because I feel like I'm always distracted and I'm not in the moment. Of course. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? That's everyone, Erin. Mm -hmm. It's everyone. Um, it is almost impossible to not be caught up in the distractions if you're not being aware of being caught up in the distractions. So that's where the quiet comes in. That's where yoga is beautiful. Meditation is a game changer. Um, gratitude pulls you back into the moment, your breath. Um, so even if you have the simplest, um, the, the best reminder to do is to breathe and feel your butt in the chair. So even just right now, everybody take a nice deep breath. You feel your butt in the chair. You can look around your room and just spot things. I see a plant, I see a chair, I see a pillow. I see flowers, I see a golf ball. Just doing something as simple of that as that is gonna bring you back into your body and remind you that you're out of the movie. So there's this great, there's a great book. Um, oh my God, it has the horse on the front. Um, is it Mark Nepo? I can't think of the book, I'll, it'll come to me. But what he talks about is you don't wanna be in the movie. You don't wanna just your life be a movie. You wanna be the one sitting back viewing the movie. You wanna be watching the movie so that you are in more control of what the characters are doing. Um, yeah, you wanna just be in your body, in your breath, aware of the fact that you are a human being living on the planet and all of this stuff is happening around you instead of being caught up and lost in the movie. That's Untethered great, Soul, that's the name of the book. The, un Un the Untethered Soul is the best book I know that teaches you how to do this hair. Thanks, Megan. I, I just have to jump in and say I was doing a master class on meditation and I was trying to figure out how to increase the playback speed. So I have a problem. Um, but one of the things that they said in that was, when you drift away, don't punish yourself on it. Gently sure. bring yourself back. And we have that tendency to go, oh, I just started a fight with someone in my head. Yeah. And then you get angry with yourself and just be gentle and, you know, bring yourself back. So um, Nicole, do you have an answer to that? I just, I wanted to add to that as well. Like anxiety and depression, you know, that's something that I, for myself, that was something I've struggled with for a long time. And anxiety is when I'm thinking about the future and depression is the past. If I come right now, nothing's wrong. I can either deal with the issue or I can't, you know, so it's a lot of times those distractions are, you know, we're anticipating something to come or we've already dealt with, you know, we're wallowing in something that we had. So just trying to find that center, you know, I think that the power of now, that was a book I, I mentioned in here yep. is a, a great, a really great book. And there's actually another book that Eckhart Tolle has, The New Earth, A New Earth. Mm -hmm. and it's very relevant to right now. So, you know, I recommend maybe checking those out if you're interested in looking for some tips to. Most of the planet is living in distractions. We all are. It doesn't come naturally for me. The only time that I'm not in the distractions is when I'm being conscious of not being in the distractions. That's, that, that's it. It's nothing, even Eckhart Tolle who has figured it out on some level Mm -hmm. gets swept up into it until he catches himself. And then as soon as you catch yourself, to Colleen's point, be as present as you can without adding the layer of beating yourself up. Right. Right. Okay. We, still not here, right? <laughs> we still have work here, right? So it's going to be happen from time to time. Yeah. Part of it. You were, you were both talking about, um, you know, basically opening yourself up and asking for help. And um, Nicole, I think of you as a, a really great case study of, you know, the pandemic hit and like Megan said, it affected everybody, this is unusual. Um, and I saw some businesses um, putting the onus on the customer and saying, well, you should just support us. And then I saw businesses like yours and many others who stepped out and said, okay, we're gonna pivot. We're gonna, we're gonna do things differently. Um, for those um, businesses that are maybe struggling or people in their professional life are maybe struggling, you know, what would be, you know, what would, do you have an aha moment or what would be your advice to, to make that mind shift from putting the onus on the people who should just buy from you to, well, what can I do? It's openness to, to shifting and changing. You have to be open to that. You know, I, some of the models that I've seen that have stuck to that old way and kind of just really rigid through this entire time, maybe had um, more 
traditional beliefs or more rigid beliefs that they had to kind of keep doing it the same and that somebody was going to come bail them out or it was going to get fixed or something was going to happen. But this is your life. This is your chance to, to adapt. You know, there, there is no going back as Megan was talking about, like it's, we're not going back to a, a new, you know, it's a new normal. It's a new thing. Like we're continuing to evolve and change. So, you know, being open to suggestions or ideas or what other people are doing, that's not copying. That's like inspiration. That's support. I, I can't tell you how many like other meal prep companies that exist. I've, I've reached out to them. I, I just said, you know, how do you do this? I don't, I don't know how to do this. And, you know, just different aspects of it. What kind of packaging do you use? That's like eco-friendly. Like, how do you find that? Like, I can't find it. Like, or whatever it is, people that don't know me, I just, someone I might admire, or I'm a fan of on social media. And, you know, I just ask for help. Like it's, and I think, I think people appreciate that. I tend to usually get pretty genuine responses. You know, if, if we can work more cooperatively, we can continue to evolve and shift versus thinking that we're like an island and we have to compete. You know, someone that's doing something very similar to you could be your best ally really in helping you to, to evolve and change and grow and adapt and navigate this situation. That's, that's such great advice, Nicole. And I know working with the nonprofit sector, we're always encouraged to collaborate. And so there's no reason that the for-profit sector can't do the same. So that's a great, um, that's a great finale to um, a really great um, summit. Um, I want to thank everyone. Um, Chris, do you want to, I'll, I'll wrap it up, but do you want to uh, throw anything in here, Chris? Again, incredible thank you to both Nicole and Megan. Uh, really a, a phenomenal morning. Just put in the chat a couple of things. We're going to, you know, send everybody the link to the recording. We'll also get the participant attendees information out to everybody. But uh, as I said, you know, just a, a second ago uh, in the chat, um, incredible wisdom that you've imparted on us at a time that we need. I mean, you've all shared this is a, a moment in time and, and no doubt a moment in time for all of us collectively as a, a community, collectively for the business community and the chamber. So um, just know we are here as well. So I reach out to Colleen, anyone on the committee, we'd love to get you connected. We, uh, we need, you know, people that are engaged and we've got incredible engagement. Let's thank Colleen and, and the committee for just a, an incredible job as well, mm -hmm. you know, for putting together, uh, you know, today's program and all the hard work that they do. And uh, I know we'd love to, you know, fill the room or fill the screen with, uh, you know, so many more. So uh, let's connect the well um, and let's fill the well. Like Megan said, you know, there, there's so much uh, out in Hunterdon County, so many great people. Um, the, the doors are open and, and the seats are, are available. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And, and yes, I um, echo the thanks to the committee that puts this together and, um, uh, also, don't also want to mention, uh, Megan, you two are receiving a gift certificate to the Wolverton Inn, compliments oh, of Mary and the Wolverton uh -huh. Inn, just as a, a small thank you to, um, we really appreciate your time and your energy. And again, your vulnerability and your honesty, it has been very powerful and very impactful. I think we have all have a lot to think about. Um, and I want to invite you before we go today, we are putting on our next event on uh, September 21st. You've heard it here, folks, the plan is in person an in-person event um, at the Wolverton Inn on September 21st. And we'd like to continue with this theme of resiliency, hopefully in person. So um, please mark your calendars. There will be more information coming out about it. Um, but in the meantime, thank you, thank you, thank you um, for uh, coming today. I know there's a real feeling of being Zoomed out. And um, I think Nicole and Megan um, just did a fantastic job in this environment and in this form of giving us some great stuff. So thanks to everyone for coming and thanks to the two of you for presenting. Thank you. Thank Everybody you. enjoy your day, enjoy your weekend, be safe. Thank you. Excellent. Bye. Thank you.